My name is Susan Foley, co-founder and executive director of a nonprofit named HESA. HESA was formed in 2012 to bring awareness, research, and support to people who have autoimmune encephalitis. HE, which stands for Hashimoto encephalopathy, is a rare and puzzling form of AE. Today we are interviewing Jessica Lee. We're going to talk to her about her journey to her diagnosis of HE. Today we are interviewing Jessica. We are going to talk to her about her journey to her diagnosis. Jessica, can you tell us your full name and also um, how old you were when you were diagnosed? So I, my name is Jessica Soski and I'm 57 currently. I was diagnosed, I think, 16 years ago. So I think I was 41 at the time. Um, the onset of symptoms started happening. The um, Well, the symptoms that I noticed started happening um, when I was my late, at the late, uh, 39, early 40. Um, and then it took a year for me to get diagnosed. I read your story that you sent me and I could have wrote it myself. I, mm. I was like, oh my gosh, the, I d went through this. I had this, I had this before I was diagnosed. Um, it was just amazing to read. So thank you for sending it to me. Oh, sure. No, that's what's so great about the, the site is the peer support right? Because it can feel so incredibly lonely, particularly dealing with the, the medical field. <laughs> yes. And, and after you've had it for a while, you tend to um, forget some of those symptoms that you had until you read somebody else talking about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, I remember well. Um, I'm going to, first of all, I want to thank you for sitting down with us today. Um, I skipped that part. <laughs> I got right Fine. Into it. Thank you Sorry. for doing this. <laughs> um, you know, you already answered my questions about how old you are. So, and how old you were when you're diagnosed. So that's great. So how long did it take you? You said a year to get diagnosed. That's actually kind of quick, right? It's, it was relatively quick. I think a little over a year, you know, and I'm sorry because I'm very blurry about dates, you know, um, but it was a little over a year. I was incredibly fortunate in the neurologist that I was first assigned to see. Um, so the thing that triggered my looking for diagnosis, um, first I had developed a slight head tremor, which I didn't know. Um, but you know, I was then living with my, um, boyfriend at the time and he told me about it and others told me about it. And so I had just switched insurance to Kaiser and I made an appointment to see a brand new doctor about this head tremor that they were seeing. And then I was taking my boyfriend actually to the airport for him to go visit his mom. And I dropped him off and I had this, I guess I would call seizure like episode things got really strange. Um, one side of my face went numb, part of the roof of my mouth went numb. It felt like everything was going in slow motion. I actually drove through a drive through to order a coffee and my voice sounded strangely slow to me. And um, that actually led me to go to ER where they ran a bunch of tests and said, we don't know what this is, it could be MS. Um, we're going to refer you to a neurologist. And that's how that process began, um, searching for a diagnosis. And then many, many other symptoms started coming in. I'm, you know, I'm happy to describe some of those. But what was interesting for me was that I then started looking back before that sort of crisis happened and realized, well, when I was in law school, my thyroid crashed. Um, it, was, it was, you know, stress is not good for the, the thyroid or the body. So I was on, I, I went on thyroid medication at that time, but now, you know, I would look back after the, um, the diagnosis and realize I had grown up skating at the beach. And when I was in at, towards the end of law school, I tried to go skating with some friends and I couldn't balance at all. 
I had also grown up playing sports. And I remember I was with my family and we were trying to throw a softball around in the park and I couldn't get my hand to release on time. So that was all prior to the sort of crisis episode. But, you know, then looking back, I realized that those were actually symptoms that had started, you know, before then. Definitely symptoms. Yes, definitely. I, you know, how did, how many doctors did you end up seeing during this period trying to get a diagnosis? Well, there was my primary care doctor, the neurologist um, that I saw, and then um, he referred me to um, an endocrinologist when he suspected HE, well, what I'm calling HE anyway. Yes, we all um, do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, and he referred me to this endocrinologist who came and, you know, after going over my um, records and talking to me said, well, you know, my colleagues and I don't believe in uh, HE. The so famous that, words. Yeah. It's like, and she started telling me about this case that they had and it came before the board she was on and they all decided that AG wasn't a real thing. And I was, I asked her like, so what happened to that person? And she said, oh, I don't know. (laughs) She was like, oh, this poor individual that (laughs) got lost in the system somewhere. So then, um, my, my neurologist, um, referred me to UCSF, um, to at the time, one of the few doctors that were even looking at HE, Bruce Cree, and for a second opinion. And he did, um, he did a physical and looked at my records and, and diagnosed me with probable HE, you know, because it was, there were no tests, you know, that were going to actually right. give them the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah, it's a diagnosis of elimination, and that really makes it hard um, for many people to get a diagnosis um, when they actually need it and they need treatment. It's kind of sad. Um, It is. And, you know, my this neurologist was an angel. He died last year and it just breaks my heart. Oh, but you know, when I was describing all these bizarre symptoms, I mean, he would listen to me. He actually tried to, I mean, he did so many tests. I mean, EEG and uh, spinal tap and, you know, I mean, so many, you know, stuff for poisoning and, you know, lead poisoning, all kinds of stuff he was looking for. And when he didn't find anything, he wanted to refer me to a rheumatologist, but Kaiser system that has to go back to your primary care doctor. And she actually refused. And she said she thought it was stress related and offered me Paxil. So I switched um, (laughs) doctors at that point, but my neurologist didn't give up on me. And when he saw my thyroid antibody levels, he, he, the HE connection, you know, occurred to him for the first time. And that's when he sent me for the, um, the second opinion to UCSF. And then I got to the point where I asked him to please put me on corticosteroids um, because I was, the functioning level was getting so hard. Um, Yeah, and and trying to work was, you know, getting near impossible. So yeah, he, you know, at that point he did. If I had a, a dime for every time somebody diagnosed me with stress before I was actually diagnosed. I wonder now if I never would have gotten the diagnosis and gotten treated where I would be. It's really scary to me. It's so scary. It's really, I mean, I know, I think every woman that has an autoimmune condition has been through some version of this just Uh, I think the younger doctors are getting better, at least the ones that I'm seeing now, but the complete skepticism that, you know, that you have anything physically wrong, you know, it's just, it was, I, one of the ways I coped, and this is a recommendation I would have for other people going through this, (laughs) is that um, a very good friend of mine, she happened to, she used to work in the Kaiser system, but she came along to, with me to all my appointments with a notepad and a pen. And I would say, this is my friend, Robin. And because I have you know, difficulty remembering things from these appointments, she's going to take notes about what we say here. And boy, did the behavior get better. Like, I don't think I would have ever gotten that, you know, it's just stress response if, um, if she had been there at that appointment. 
I always recommend somebody taking somebody with them, um, just like you said, to take notes or to advocate for them because we don't always remember yeah. what we wanted to tell the doctor while we're in there because of our memory issues yeah, and, exactly. and, and we answer questions slowly. So yeah, it, it's so smart to take somebody with you. That was really smart of you to do that. How, how, how did you feel during this whole process? You know, during that diagnosis process, you know, it's so emotional. So I just kind of wondered how you felt. You know, it was corresponding with such a wide range of symptoms. Like, I mean, you know, suddenly I wouldn't be able to hold my uh, phone in my hand or, you know, I couldn't walk more than a few feet without my legs buckling. But on top of that, I was having um, all the uh, mental impact of the inflammation. So there was times where I had hallucinations. I remember waking up and seeing this gigantic spider walking up the wall. And fortunately, I'm, I'm fortunate in that always some piece of my logical brain stayed intact. So even while I was watching that, and I remember reaching over and pinching myself to make sure I was awake, <laughs> you know, some part of my brain was saying, you're having a hallucination. But there were days where the reality distortion got so bad that I felt like I was in some kind of scary movie, you know, like where, it, I mean, it was just missing the scary movie um, soundtrack, you know, and I can remember standing in my shower and crying, crying and going, these are the same tiles that have always been here. This is my shower. I don't understand why I feel like I'm on some other planet. Like, you know, it just was, so I had all the, the brain inflammation stuff and other symptoms going on on top of trying to deal, of course, with the diagnosis. So it was, um, it was scary. Um, it, it, it just, I felt my emotions were all over the place. And then there were a few times when it was really bad where like, I can remember like in the middle of the day, crawling into a closet and just covering up oh. to avoid to avoid doing something that might hurt myself because yeah, because there was just so much distortion in, in my perception and at times like despair and um, yeah. And even, you know, I, I don't have any of it this extreme anymore, but even now if the inflammation gets triggered, sometimes it's almost to me like having an electrode plant implanted in the the pain or agony part of the brain, you know, and that's kind of what I remember is just having these bouts of um, just agony and despair. What, what other symptoms um, can you think of that you were experiencing throughout this episode? Yeah, they were all over the place. Um, I mean, definitely muscle weakness, you know, varying quite a bit. Um, it, and I still have never, I, like, I don't have normal muscle strength today, but it's really much better than it was towards the beginning. Um, like the myoclonic jerks, I, I still have where I, when I go to reach for something, sometimes my hand does a jerk and I end up throwing it, you know. It's, <laughs> I spill a lot, so I get it. <laughs> yeah. So, and I still have that, but there was um, like bladder control sometimes was a problem for me. Um, like crazy, I don't even, migraine isn't the right word for it, head pain. Um, that was just unreal, you know, I it know. So I get it. bad. Um, and yeah, coordination stuff, walking into walls, difficulty doing certain moves. Um, so yeah, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot muscular, a lot related to muscle strength and coordination. Um, yeah, there, I went through a period too where I felt like something was wrong with my color perception. So in the beginning, and that made me think it was MS, you know, because they, they talk about that a lot. But I would just, I would look at things and I'd, be, I'd go, I know that's yellow, but it's not 
something's missing, something's not right. And I can remember going on corticosteroids and just standing in front of something with color and going, oh my God, this is right. <laughs> this is the color. It was like everything got weirdly washed out for me. It registered um, in your brain after you started medication, huh? That yeah. it really was the color yellow. <laughs> 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 yeah, it just, it was like, that is right. It was, yeah, everything was so washed out for a while. And I have this memory of, I used to love fireworks. I mean, I, I, um, I loved going to shows where I was right underneath them. It would, it would evoke a kind of a, a thrill and excitement in my body that of response. And I remember my boyfriend then and I at the time, um, we went to a fireworks show and I was standing underneath them and they're exploding overhead. And it's like nothing, flat, nothing, nothing. Like this, this part of my brain that used to take in color and sound and respond in a certain way, just, it was like, it was totally missing. I always say that was one of my worst um, symptoms was the empathy. I had none. And it's so hard to explain to someone where you feel so flat that you know, you should be happy and you can't be, you know, you should be sad, but you can't be the feelings, you know, you know what you should be feeling, but it's not there. It's not there. It's right. And, you know, um, the, I call it, and hedonia. I don't, I don't know, you know, any other better word for it, but it was interesting because even after, so I was on high dose corticosteroids and, and various levels for a while, it took me several years to wean off of them. And then I went on low dose naltroxone, which has been, you know, helped me maintain. But even after that, I still had that anhedonia, that flat line that just, nothing registering, nothing mattering. No. And, um, it was funny because I was watching a house episode of all things <laughs> <laughs> and there was in the episode, um, there was, uh, some disease that these folks had that impacted dopamine levels in their brain and the way they were showing it, the people being like flat, almost zombie, like, I'm like, I think this has affected my dopamine levels. And I remember I went to my neurologist and at that point I went on Wellbutrin and it was helpful to me. And I, I do really think that that was an impact on dopamine levels. You know, I mean, sure, probably other things too, but I think dopamine was a big piece of that. What other treatments have you been on? Or has it been just those two treatments? The IV, I mean, the steroids and um... like medication wise, um, I, yeah, they, the, that was the standard treatment was um, prednisone through, you know, and so that's what I was on for several years. And then those side effects got so bad. I mean, my blood pressure was crazy. Um, I was having heart palpitations, all kinds of stuff. And um, my kidney uh, numbers were bad too. So um, I knew I had to wean off of it. And, um, and, and that's, you know, I heard about low dose naltroxin. They were doing a study at the time anyway. And, and that's where I ended up weaning onto that. So those are the main medications. Now there was at the beginning, they had me on nortriptyline for neurological pain. Um, I was on a tenolol for blood pressure that went up with the corticosteroids. Um, trying to think, I think there were other sort of medications for various side effects in there in the beginning. But the two main forms of treatment that I have had have been the, the prednisone and the, um, the low dose naltroxin. And it's um, worked for you. That's great. It's worked for me with lifestyle change. And I like, I know this is true for me. You know, I know everybody is different, but I realized that, um, that medication alone was not going to get me um, to where I wanted to be. And so I started, I mean, one, I, I couldn't do my career anymore. So I left um, the law and I went into, um, I became a grant writer, which had a lot more flexibility with it. 
Um, was fortunate when I was diagnosed, I was working for an, an agency called World Institute on Disability that is oh. run by people with disabilities. Talk about like, I feel like that was just like that the universe, you know. It was meant to be. Care of me. Yes. <laughs> so when I was going through all that, I was in a workplace of people that got it in a way that I have never been again in a group, you know, except for this one that gets it like that. So I was so fortunate in that way. But um, I started looking at dietary, you know, and so I, I found a MD naturopath um, that I started working with outside of Kaiser. Um, so there's all kinds of supplements that I take really most focused on reduction of inflammation. Um, and then I eventually, after experimenting with multiple types of diets ended up on what they call the whole foods plant-based diet, which is, you know, I basically am plant-based, but I'm, I eat almost no processed food. Right. So, and, um, those changes too, you know, and then I did all kinds of meditation and hypnosis <laughs> and, um, I did lymph drain drainage massage at one point when I was so bloated from the, um, the prednisone, but, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like the lifestyle changes are a really big piece for me. And so I would never say that low dose naltroxone in and of itself has kept me stable because if I wasn't doing all the rest, I just know from experience that um, it would be different. And even now, like a few weeks ago, I caught a bug. It wasn't COVID, I was tested. But sometimes when I get viruses and my body does not fight them off well, um, it triggers uh, the encephalopathy. And so I spent a few days feeling like I was underwater and, you know, like not myself, like kind of looking through somebody else's eyes. And, you know, unfortunately, like I, I have experience to know, you know, what it's connected with, but yeah. So I still get the symptoms more intensely if I catch a virus or something that triggers the inflammation. I had COVID, I caught COVID oh. Christmas day. And um, so it ran through, you know, beginning of January, but I have to say, I know exactly what you're talking about. It triggered um, a lot of my HE symptoms. And yeah. I kept thinking, I know it's just a relapse. You know, I, I didn't have to go in and get treated. I maybe should have, but I was like, if once you start to realize what it is and, you know, I rusted a lot and slept and, you know, you can kind of, sometimes you can sort of ease yourself out of it, but, and I have to agree with you with stress. Stress to me is one of the biggest triggers mm -hmm. that there is to have a relapse or even to develop the disease. I think stress in itself is really bad. I, I so agree with you. I feel like so many of the, the people that I've talked to with HE, like they have similar backgrounds of like, sort of like pushing, <laughs> overachieving, <Hi -fi. laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, and, and whatever underlying genetic predisposition we had, you know, it was like, you know, just was a bad, bad combination. I did a survey one time on the sites that um, asking people if what personality type do, do they claim that think that they are type A, type B, type. I swear everyone was a type A. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, you know, it makes sense, right? Yeah, the body yeah. under stress breaks down. And I so know. I was, I was definitely a type A. There was no um, <laughs> doubt about it. Um, <laughs> it. It was, you know, the, when it, the point where I started having the crisis level symptoms, I think my mother was in hospice in Southern California. My best friend was in hospice. 
I was working two jobs and I was going back and forth to LA to help take care of my mother while she was dying. And it's like, if I knew then what I know now, I would just, I would realize that I was, you know, driving myself over a ledge. But you probably couldn't change it because some things are forced on us in life. And, you know, what are you going to stop, right? You know, you're yeah. going to take care of your mom. You're going to help your friend. Um, you have, you know, I was in a very similar situation. That's what I was saying. When I read your story, I was like, I could resonate my, <laughs> yes, yes. I was like, oh my gosh, she's writing about me. <laughs> you know, if, if you were going to um, give anybody advice that's going to go through or are trying to get a diagnosis, or they're just diagnosed with HE, what advice would you give them? A few things. Um, I think one, as I said before, that taking the person and taking notes is so important. The thing that I did, I have this hyper analytical mind. And when, when everything felt so out of control, I needed to feel control over something. So I started a symptom chart and I, it listed all my symptoms. It tracked the dates, time periods, you know, when they were happening, if they were fluctuating, um, I made notes on what seemed to trigger it. And so I had this, I did it in Excel and I have this really detailed chart. So that was helpful actually in dealing with doctors and specialists to be able to say, you know, these are the symptoms I'm noticing. I've been tracking them, you know, because as you mentioned, you know, our recall is not always the best. Our articulation is not always the best. We get in a stressful situation, like in the doctor's office and our ability to paint the whole picture is limited. And so I found the symptom tracking um, to be helpful to, to remind me what I had been experiencing, but also doctors could relate to it in a way that, um, uh, that my own descriptions, you know, um, didn't get through at the same level. So that would be another one that I would really encourage people to look at. And then as you mentioned, sh the stress trigger. So like, what are the stressors in your life? And how can you start reducing them? And how can you increase your tools for coping with stress? Um, you know, so like I got into a meditation practice, you know, I did guided visualization, all kinds of things to help, you know, with um, with stress to to minimize stress. You know, changed changed my career. I didn't have a choice about leaving it, but you know to that's far less stressful. Um, so that I think is a big thing. And then um, I, you know, like, I think we all do. I became like, you know, this sort of lay expert on certain things, right? You start researching, right? <laughs> and <yeah>. so <laughs> I read like all these um, NIH studies, you know, and, um, and, uh, and so I started realizing as I was looking at this stuff, you know, looking at for studies that, you know, had something to do with inflammation, anything related. And I, I started going, wow, they do all these studies on like antioxidants and their impact, but not one doctor ever talks to you about it. I mean, these are official NIH studies, but you're not getting that from your doctor. And so I started to realize that um, the role of nutrition is huge um, in the body's healing process. And so that would be another thing I would encourage people to take a look at is just, um, you know, nutrition and, and so especially the, you know, the antioxidant level that it, they're taking in that can help keep inflammation, you know. I, the part where you said about um, writing down your symptoms, you know, daily or hourly, I remember doing that um, before I was ever diagnosed, I started journaling and I'd go day by day. I, sometimes it was hour by hour because symptoms changed hour by hour. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I tell you, it was also very helpful when it was time to um, apply for disability. You have everything documented and how you did it was probably a great way of doing it. Myself, just hand wrote everything. But I think as long as you have that information there that you can re, um, bring to a doctor and say, hey, look at this, you know, um, I'm having this, I'm having that. I that's just the smartest move to make, I think, when you're having symptoms, no matter what you're diagnosed with. Right, no matter what's going on is, yeah, you know, trying to group them together and figure out, you know, exactly, yeah, how they interrelate. I absolutely agree. I think it's so important, as you said, and, you know, for application for disability, you know, I, at one point, I was talking to my neurologist when I was in such bad shape and I'm like, um, you know, would you support me in a disability claim? And he said, absolutely. Now at that point I was working at world Institute on disability. They were letting yeah. me flex my hours and do all this stuff. So, um, I, I didn't have to file for disability. And then I feel like through all my, my work and life changes and the medication and everything, I got to a place where, I'm functional enough that at this point I would not be able to, I would not be successful in a disability claim. And yet I don't lead a normal life. Like I work from home, thank God, because I the kid, it was <laughs> killing me. I was really getting to the point where I did ask my work for reasonable accommodation to, to shorten my, my work week at some one point, but it was still getting to be too much, but like just, it's like I work, I sleep, I manage most weekends to, you know, take out the trash, vacuum, clean the house, you know, once in a while, go for a walk with a friend. But my lifestyle is extremely limited, you know, it's just, and I'm so used to it now, I, I don't even think of it that way. But I have friends that are talking about, oh, I travel here, I'm going here. And it's like, that's just not my world. That all. is so interesting that you're saying that because I actually just did um, another little speech that I'm going to post about the, when you're sick like this, I mean, okay, of course we all know we don't look sick, but, um, right. you know, you are so limited and people have no idea how limited you are. You know, I myself, I can, I'm fine for about four hours a day. So within that four hours, I might vacuum, sit down, do the dishes, sit down for a while. Um, I, of course, work on HESA a lot, but um, by five o'clock at night or four o'clock, my brain is done. My body is done. I cannot no longer um, function as a normal person functions. And I've often thought, oh, it would be so nice to get a part-time job. There's no way. You cannot, I cannot get up in the morning and know how I'm going to feel for the rest of that day, right? You need exactly. to be able to sit down when you have to. And I don't know of any <laughs> job that's going to say, okay, well, come on in whenever you feel like, you know, you're good enough to come. So I get it. I know just yeah. what you're saying, just exactly. And you can't plan. Yeah, you know, I mean, you do, but I, and this is like, it's interesting. Okay. You, what you just said reminded me of a, an issue that I thought a lot about, which is the planning thing. Um, I used to have a pretty wide circle of friends and they're all really cool, empathetic people. And I'm still in touch with them to some degree, but, you know, I had to let so many friendships go because I can't hold up my end in friendships, I can't, you know, and I had some friends that didn't get it. Like, why couldn't you be there for me when I'm moving? Or why couldn't you be, you know, but um, so I, my circle is small. Um, I, I don't have energy for, you know, to make it any bigger. Um, I it. And, and the, I'm lucky in that, you know, some of my friends have chronic conditions where, they get it. So our rule is always like, you don't feel good, cancel. You know, it's like, no, I mean, health first, 
you know, no apologies, no questions asked, just do what you need to do. But um, yeah, it's my, um, I've, I've like figured out how to manage my life, like just manage it within the parameters that I have. All it takes is for something additional to exactly. give me the huge <laughs> reminder that like I am just coping, right? I am just coping and anything more, you know, can send me into a spiral. Oh, that is so true. Uh, that's a good statement because I know I'm myself like that. I mean, one extra thing added on into my day, it's just, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about being flooding, you know, the flooding is such a good way to put it when um, you try to do too much and your brain just can't take it. No, know? completely. I remember in the early days, um, I was, in addition to my other work, I was um, an on-site property manager for the building. Oh my I was gosh. In. And I remember walking into the office some days and looking at the desk, and I remember taking a blanket and throwing it over the desks and the files and everything, because I'm like, I am so overwhelmed just looking at this stuff. I've got to hide it. It's just too much. Um, and that is one thing, I, it's a coping mechanism for me as when I'm in a place of overwhelm, or I'm having the wavy reality experience Hyper focusing on some very specific <laughs> task is <Yeah>. helpful. <laughs> so whether, yep. If I'm able to read, you know, then get into the story. If I'm able to watch something, get into that. If I'm able to play a word game, get into that. But keep my focus very narrow and very immediate because if I start trying to go for any kind of larger picture or any kind of what's in the future, it will just induce overwhelm and panic oh my gosh I am so much like that I when I get that overwhelm feeling or flooding I have to not talk to anybody I have to sit by myself in a room I have to I can focus on tv but it's just tv it's not anything else I don't of course I live by myself so you know there's nobody except my dogs but I am um, it's that narrowness, like you said, mm -hmm. it has to be focused on one thing and I cannot, it takes me a while to come out of that, a couple yeah. hours and then yeah. I'm pretty much okay, but boy, that's an awful feeling to have. Oh, it's so, it's so hard. I mean, yeah. And keeping your mind away from, remember, you know, just the first several times I was in that place there, you know, you, you kind of want to panic. Like, I mean, you're, the panic starts to come up like, oh my God, what if it stays like this? What if I'm not, ever, you know, your brain. And it's like learning to go, uh-uh, we're not, we're not even going there. We're going <laughs> to focus on this little thing, this little thing in front of us right now and know that we're with rest and time, it's going to shift. And, you know, being able to self-talk through those time periods is really important too. Have you ever had it happen to you when you had company? I have had it happen to me when I've had people over and I get that overwhelming feeling and um, flooding, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's hard. What do you do? Hide yourself in a room? I mean, it was, I remember one time it scared the heck out of me because I didn't know how to handle it when there was somebody else there. Mm -hmm. it's scary yeah, it if you're by be. yourself yeah if you're by yourself you can you know do what you need to do that you know that's gonna work but when you're um you have other people around you it's difficult it does it adds a whole other dimension and being able to shut off from the world you know because I have found that when I'm in that wavy reality place if I try to talk to somebody have a normal conversation I just become hyper aware of how weird I feel. So it's better for me not to be in communication. You know, like, like we, we all do. I learned to fake 
my way through a lot of situations. <laughs> and I remember one time I had probably the worst reality distortion experience. It lasted for three days and like nothing. I look out at the I'd look out at the world and I'd go, it's utter chaos, meaninglessness. You know, it just was this awful, dark, horrifying place. But you know, I went to work during that time period <laughs> and I would go in, I would sit at my computer. I would focus on whatever task was in front of me. You know, I would say hi to people. I wasn't very talkative. I would come home. So I was like, I was living in, in mental hell, but you know, nobody around me would have known how bad that was. That's because you're that A personality and that if you have to go to work, you're going to go to work <laughs> no matter what, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm much better than I used to be. I, I don't have the same personality type as I used to have. I mean, we change uh, so much, right? So oh, I, I, I say that I used to be the A plus personality. Now I'm kind of like a C minus. <laughs> piece of paper on the floor it'll stay there <laughs> yeah oh yeah you know spill something one night and go on the kitchen floor and it's like I I just it's too much I can't deal with it I'll I'll look at it tomorrow maybe That's I'll right. be able to clean it up then because and it's so hard to explain I remember trying to say to a doctor at one point when my muscle weakness was intense but also just I was in a bad place it's like how taking out the trash could be too much to do. Taking out the recycle felt like too much to do. And it's like, people don't get it. Like, well, if you're not in a wheelchair, if you're not, you know, exactly. like how could that be too much? And it's like, but it's too much. That's, I, I always say it's like, um, it's too much to take a shower. I mean, that sounds terrible, but the idea of taking a shower to me, it's gotta be planned and it's, difficult because I have to be in the I have very weak muscles also I have issues with my muscles but it's like a big deal and what same thing with taking out the trash that's a big deal I have to actually plan it <laughs> to get it done because otherwise it's not gonna and I look like the picture of health <laughs> I know it doesn't, you know, it, yeah. I mean, there were points where it's kind of like when I, when my, my knees used to buckle after a short distance of walking, that there was some outward physical signs. But now, like I say, I've gotten myself to this place that is, you know, functional and enough that like, yeah, that um, people would never guess, you know, they, yeah. That Maybe that's good in are. a way, right? <laughs> it is what it is yeah it, it is what it is what the heck you know I, I've just learned now especially when I'm trying to speak and my words do not you know I see the word but it won't come out of my mouth and I'll just explain to people if they don't know me that I have a autoimmune brain disease I said so if I say something that doesn't make sense <laughs> blame it on that it gets me out of a lot of things. <laughs> well, it's, you know, and you're smart for saying that, you know, I guess like in still in the work world, I, I mean, I am open about like telling my colleagues, you know, I have a condition, but I, but I'm cautious about how much I'll admit what it affects. And, you know, one of the things um, is that when I worked as a lawyer, I did a ton of public speaking, you know, it was something I actually enjoyed doing. But then my recall and memory now is so off that like a lot of times when I have to speak with a group, uh, it's like so much anxiety comes up because I don't, yeah, I just, I can't rely on my ability or brain or all of it to work right. Oh yeah, I get that. <laughs> I definitely, um, and it's sometimes, you know, it's a little embarrassing, but, you know, I, like I said, I'm always open and honest and just say, usually right up front, you know, <laughs> I, I've got to tell you right now that there's going to be some issues when I'm talking. So, <laughs> uh, well, good for you. Yeah. Uh, you're doing that. I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, with with good friends, I feel like I can say it. I still am not. Yeah, in the professional world, I feel like I. Yeah, and I, I, and I understand that totally. I do, I do. Yeah. Well, it's been really wonderful that you were willing to sit down with us today and talk to us. I know. Um, it's going to help a lot of people that um, might be getting diagnosed or looking for a diagnosis, um, trying to deal with everything. It's so um, good to hear somebody else, like you said, with the groups, you're hearing somebody else that's going through the same thing that you have been or, you, you know, you are. So uh, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for doing this. And I just like at this point, being so far down the line, you know, 17 years in or whatever, I just feel like, um, I, you know, I almost, I feel like a duty to be able to share that with people who are at the beginning, because like I can say, I have a life that I manage. I even have a job that I manage, you know, I, I have to be very careful <laughs> to manage it. And I know that in the beginning, like people are questioning you know, whether there's any future at all. Like, I remember really thinking that I wasn't going to live, you know, oh, yeah. on a, on a fast downhill trajectory and I wasn't going to live, or if I did that, I would be in a state of dementia, you know, but, um, yeah. And so, that's so you know. scary. That's so scary when you're, and you got diagnosed so many years ago. I mean, mine was 11 years, but yours was that much longer that there really wasn't any, information out there. Beverly, um, uh, Beverly Seminara, I think her name yes, is. Anyway, yes. that, she was like the only one you could find anything yes. from, I mean, because at that point it wasn't even considered a real disease. I mean, yes. it wasn't in the diagnostic and, um, yeah, it was. And so I would, you know, even years later at my Kaiser appointments with my primary care physician, I would try to mention how it affected me. And they just like, they seemed to skip over it and focus on something else. It was like, they were so uncomfortable. Because they didn't know about it. Yet. What's that? Because they're not educated in it. They don't understand. Yeah, but it, it makes you kind of feel crazy because it's <laughs> like, here, I'm talking to my doctor and it feels like they're pretending that I don't really have this, that I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what does it take? I always find myself educating like newer doctors about the disease because, you know, well, we weren't really taught very much about that um, in medical school. And I'm like, well, <laughs> and not that I'm an expert, but, you know, when you go through all the symptoms and all your diagnosed process and everything that, you know, you, you do know quite a lot. Well, you become an expert on your experience and that experience is tied to the condition. So exactly. You know, so you, yep. yeah, if you're, you know, we're lucky you get doctors that will listen and want to want to learn, but the medical profession is not always great. Um, Susan, there is just one other symptom I, sure. I just thought of that was, is still an, an issue for me is vertigo. I forgot to mention. Oh, that. I have it all the time too. I know. I do not travel. I mean, I will drive a car, but I do not travel. I do not fly. I do not. And because motion makes it much, much worse. But yeah, that was one. I mean, I remember it first time it happened, I was trying to do a yoga pose and then it hit and I couldn't get off the floor. So yeah, that was my, my first time it hit was right when I started to get sick and I was at work. And I had to go home. Somebody had to drive me home. I was so bad. And ever since then, I do have periods of it off and on yet. And um, a lot of periods of dizziness. I mean, I can't, and the balance issue, you know, I still a little unstable, <laughs> to say the least. I still but, walk into walls every, you yeah. know, occasionally. And <laughs> Or in the grocery store, it's really embarrassing. Like somebody's trying to avoid me and I'm going sideways. I'm like, no, I'm not trying to knock into you. I'm sorry. It's just I'm not controlling my I am the same way. I have absolutely no um I I always say that I have um oh I can't even see, I can't think of the word. So forget it. <laughs> okay. 
I can't think of the word, but I, you know, it's even driving. Sometimes I realize that um, I'm not, you know, my perception of things isn't quite what it should be. And I realize that myself and um, that makes it a little bit difficult. <laughs> Yeah, no, it does. It does. That's why like, I am, I keep my life very, it's very circumscribed. I don't, you know, there's, there's these boundaries that I live within and, you know, Makes it's, it manageable. Simpler. <laughs> it's manageable, you know, yep. I can, and I can find some joy in that. It took me a lot of time of accepting I'm not who I used to be. I mean, years and years of fighting it in, in my mind, but I used to be able to do this, but I used to be able to do that, but I used to, and it, like years to get that voice to like chill out and, and go, <laughs> you know, this is where I, where I am right now. And wow, the sky is blue and look at those birds and, you know, just really finding, you know, the little bits of, of peace and joy where I can find it. Mm. I think for myself, being the age I'm at, makes it a lot simpler because as I've gotten older, I'm like, well, you know, I'm lucky to be here and, you know, I, I'll take exactly. whatever I get. <laughs> exactly. I, it's like, I do say that it's like, I mean, honestly, it's like, I, I don't want to say living on borrowed time exactly, but you know, I mean, there was a point where I thought I, I wouldn't be here. And exactly. so like everything beyond that is a gift, yes. you know? Um, yes. It doesn't always feel like it when you're in the middle of a really bad. <laughs> I agree on that one, but you can always look at the positive. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean that that self talk thing of learning how to self soothe and self talk and be your own cheerleader through those really really dark times is so important. And I've also, um, I know I said bye a while ago here, but I also think, and I've told um, many members this that. It helps to get a purpose in your life yet. Yeah. You might not be able to do what you were doing or um, you're disappointed in, you know, your abilities and things. But if you can find a purpose, you know, anything, whether it's um, knitting hats for the cancer ward at the mm -hmm. hospital or whatever it might be, um, I think that really gets you through a lot of it. Absolutely. You, yeah, there's got something that lets you feel like there's um, a bigger picture that you're, you know, functioning for, you know, exactly giving meaning to your world. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to say goodbye again. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. So much. And just it's been such a pleasure talking to you. It's like therapy. Just yes, to talk about yes. all this stuff. I so. really enjoyed it. I felt like oh. I knew you before I got on here. No, and I know. It's just like, oh, my AG soul sister. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a great day now. Thank you so much. You as well, Susan. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.